Yeah, it's recording anyway. Perfect. Well, it's great to see you, and it's great to be able to speak to you live. Uh, yeah, great. Real, <laughs> and, and in real time. It's almost like we're in the same room here. Absolutely. But, David, I read the article that you've written about the protests in uh, Portland, and I found it very, very, very interesting. And they stimulated a few thoughts and ideas in my mind in and around what, why has that protest been so successful and that that's been consecutive for, I don't know, 50 or 52 or 55 nights. So yeah, it keeps uh, on building. It does it all right, excellent. Because I mean, it was it was not outcome. always constant, but it was it was. Uh, I think it kept on going, and and I mean, they say it was getting uh, you know smaller, but I think it was it was going in waves, uh, depending on a lot of factors. Okay. But one of the things that kept on, I mean, it was for one thing, it was police response was terrible. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, so that, that uh, tended to get a lot of people angry and get a lot more people into the streets after a whole bunch of people got tear gassed. That was one factor. I think another factor was every time uh, some, some new lynching occurred somewhere else in the country, mm -hmm. you know, by carried out by police or whatever that tended to get into the news around here and then, you know, piss people off more uh, as it did elsewhere. That was one factor. Another was, people certain elements <laughs> had the goal of taking over police stations like they did in minneapolis and seattle yeah, well, and uh so so there was uh you know some some element that would never be happy until they could take the police station over you know so that's kind of a high bar but it keeps the street fighting <laughs> going you know because if you don't get what your goal is, if you don't haven't made your goal, if the goal is to mm -hmm. actually get the police to flee and take over the station, that's a pretty high bar. And, you know, it happened in a couple of situations in Minneapolis and in Seattle, you know, fairly early on after the George Floyd killing. But um, it, it didn't get repeated elsewhere, as far as I know, you know, that that uh, sort of abandonment of the police stations. OK, what, what, what do you think? So obviously, there's been like a. Like a lot, it's not it's, it's not a revolution in inverted commas, but there's there's a catalyst. The latest catalyst was the murder of uh, George Floyd. But is this fitting in with a with a wider context of what's happening in America uh, and and a broader expanse throughout the world? There seems to be a push, it's certainly in different in different uh, political arenas throughout the world. There appears to be a push away from neoliberal austerity with people not necessarily embracing socialism, but they're looking for a change. They're looking for some form of, of an antidote to, you know, minimum wage, homelessness, lack of social housing, lack of a proper security uh, network for people's welfare benefits. Is this, are we just scratching the surface of, of, a, of a whole kind of uh beneath the surface anxiety that's that's kind of another pandemic across the world i think uh i mean it, it's contentious and i think it depends on who you ask and what kind of answer you'll get to that question because i think there are certain folks that would feel that anything that's taking attention away from the issue of institutional racism and police mm -hmm. violence and lynchings against black people is uh is sort of like uh, uh, you know distracting in a way and i you know, like where you know i can see where people are coming from when they're talking about that but and 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 definitely this uprising was uh set off by by the lynching of of uh, george floyd but um it was it's also but also what's been happening and and you you hear it coming from so many different quarters of of uh you know radical black intellectuals like cornell west and 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 the, the minister who's the head, heads the uh uh the uh, what is it the group um there was a poor people's economic rights he, uh, he economic human rights campaign I, all kinds of people amplifying the head of the ame church the, the african methodist church in uh, seattle you know all kinds of people making the connection uh, that well if like the asking the if then statements like if black lives matter then what about affordable housing if black lives matter then you know what about uh, ed, the education not being uh, funded by except by local taxes so it's 
ensuring that education is always a sort of an apartheid system in this country. Uh, and all, asking all kinds of questions. Like if Black Lives Matter, why is Cancer Alley in Louisiana f uh, on around all the oil plat or oil drilling industry? Why is it so completely full of black people? I mean, is why do black people live in the most polluted neighborhoods? I mean, you know, asking these questions, and then it it naturally, it naturally it, it causes anybody with a brain to start making serious analysis about the capitalist system along with institutional racism, because these things are very, very mm -hmm. intimately tied together. And it's very, very obvious, I think, to more increasing numbers of people from across the board that uh, trying to uh, trying to uh, undo institutional racism uh, in the context of a cutthroat capitalist system that has been using racism as a tool to divide people for centuries and and has continued to do that i mean it, it's not working you know you, they're not going to solve the problem uh, and, and they they continue to exacerbate the problem in fact the ruling class in so many different ways uh, they continue the problem it's still real and you know they're still imprisoning you know uh, more than two thirds of the people in prison are people of color, and you know, you know the statistics: eighty-seven percent of people who work in slaughterhouses are people of color in this country. You know, it's just um, it's an apartheid state in so many ways, and it's it's not all uh, about race. There's loads of poor white people as well. But the, the thing is that people are making these 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 connections all over the place. So I think what's happening, and maybe from the very beginning, is 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 the base really basic aspects of the whole structure of the society and, and are being questioned in all kinds of different ways so it's i'd say you know it's often being called intersectional it's certainly multiracial but it's very it's a very broad kind of thing that's uh, starting to happen although i think in terms of where it might be going mm -hmm. uh you know it's it's anybody's guess but definitely there's lots of common talk uh, about things like defunding the police yeah, yeah. and uh, that and is the military. defunding the military and it's very clear that the, uh, the the people in power you know in the states and 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 most cities and certainly in the federal government have no of both parties have no interest in defunding police or defunding the military. And in fact, they just passed mm. the biggest military budget ever in the history of the world last <laughs> week. <laughs> On top of the biggest one the previous year, I was just reading that. Uh, Which was the biggest the in the history of the world. Yeah. America's their uh, military expenditures at 35% of the yeah. total of the 37% last I just looked it up yesterday yeah, yeah 37% 30, according like, to whatever Google whatever the exactly. source was on top I, 37% I saw, I saw 35% earlier so what, what, there, there's there's a couple of questions come out of this one, one of them is 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 there is there a political manifesto from Black Lives Matter now, I understand that the people on the street are uh protesting about the police brutality and institutional racism uh, in america uh but is is there a political manifesto to come out of this is there I, i'm surprised they're not running a third party candidate i'm surprised they didn't take philanese floyd george's brother and run him as a black third party presidential candidate because biden for me is not a proper uh he, he, he's not a real contender against Trump. So while, while you have this duopoly of the Republicans and the Democrats, who are both capitalist elitist parties bought by the corporations, there'll be no change on the ground for anybody, regardless of their race, color, religion in America. So wh wh where's it all going to go? It can't just be street protest without a political agenda manifesto to carry through the changes they want to see in government or would it be your opinion that maybe a revolution another american revolution is maybe the only way to change the status quo well i mean i think um th there's there's so many different potential ways to 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 influence uh governments mm -hmm. and and we can see that around the world and just taking very recent examples i mean i think uh, I think, to, like, and in, 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 it's been written about in in the mainstream press a lot that the Gilets Jaunes, that the Yellow Vest movement yes, in France, is. has what? done more to uh, cause uh, the state to to make concessions uh, to to the the interests of in the, in the interests of the working class. They've done more 
than uh, than the labor movement has in decades. And I don't I don't remember the specifics, but it seemed to be uh, something that a lot of a lot of journalists were saying. And it, it's, I think the same can be said. The, about, the labor movement, in some respects, is part of the establishment. That's how I view it here. I'm a trade right? union supporter, but I believe that in some level, it's all it's all interconnected, and there's no real. A bit, a bit yeah. like the false thing around politics, the false bosses and trade unions that people are in comfortable positions, don't want to rock the boat, the people aren't going to come out on strike. So, you know, negotiate for the best deal you can get from the employer. But I don't see any real radicalism yeah. in the trade union movement. And there's the, there's the right wow. wing of the trade union as well. People that are just self-protectionists. But I, yeah. I, I hope they actually see what the yellow vests have done. I know Macron had the back down around some stuff about, I think it was pensions and the retirement age. Yeah, yeah, guys, uh, yeah, the right, right. Mm -hmm. now, Which was know. a big deal, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, and I think, I mean, here in the U.S., I think it's a lot of people would say, like, like the reforms of the 1930s and the New Deal, they get talked about a lot in terms of like mm -hmm. the Roosevelt's progressivism. Uh, but I think the Wall Street oh, crash then and the huge unemployment, the dust bowl. Exactly, that's the America. thing. It's like that kind of like it was like what you saw with this big two trillion, three three trillion dollar bailout, which was mostly a corporate bailout, but still, what the the. Uh, the thing was that, that it was bipartisan and the reason why there was bipartisan support for this kind of massive government spending just as in the 30s was because of the circumstances but also not just the circumstances but what were those circumstances not just the the crash of the stock market and and the sudden you know the loss of work for for so many people and, and the economic situation but the response to that by the people which was to organize and to to uh, have massive rallies to to uh, in, organize uh, unemployed workers councils, they were unevicting people so much that they had to ban evictions altogether in the city of Chicago. You know, so th there was this kind of resistance going on in the streets, which led the government. I mean, in 1931, I remember reading in Zinn's People's History of the U.S., it stuck with me. In 1931, just in that one year alone, there were 500 different incidences of more than a hundred armed people liberating warehouses of their uh, uh, contents, you know, in different parts of the country. Like there's this, that was the atmosphere, you know, so it was a, it was a sort of a scary situation for the ruling class. But I think uh, as, as sort of like people might say the same about the, the riots that, that you might, you know, that have, they've been characterized as riots anyway in the media after the killing of George Floyd that occurred in cities throughout the country, where including in Portland, if you go to downtown Portland, you'll see that most of it is boarded up and destroyed, you know, but, and, and that's true of many different cities in this country. And, and to me, it's like uh, generally, you know, actually living in the context of of the of a country where that's becoming so much more divided between the rich and the poor, where my own rent has gone up by two hundred fifty percent in the past, you know, in the, since I've lived in Portland, it's uh, this the kind of untenable situation. It, it really, uh, I think, there's a lot of people who who feel really good about seeing all those corporate stores mm -hmm. smashed up you know it, it, it's just not a not a a lot of people aren't shedding any tears about it and they feel actually it's therapeutic and i think the people destroying uh, all those stores it was a wide variety of people not just the usual black block right. and, and they you know they couldn't they couldn't say this was outside agitators you know because it was happening everywhere at the same time you know it was a lot of people doing it it was uh, really quite a cross section young uh, very much tending towards the youth but uh, otherwise it quite a cross section of uh, society and uh, you know and then that scared the ruling class for sure regardless of whether the demands were clear you know um and uh, they're not going to defund the police but they are probably going to extend a whole lot of moratoriums on evictions right. you know and other kinds of reform they're going to send more money to people you know it won't be enough and and uh, you know whether it's going to be enough to you know really change people's lives for the better or or fend off chaos or, or potentially all kinds of movements that the ruling class will feel very threatened by uh you know who knows what what the future holds but they're scared for sure uh, because you can't just have we're looking at 28 million evictions between now and september and you and you you could see that multiracial crowds of people just trashed the centers of 
most of the major cities in the country you know at the end of last may so it's it's a message <laughs> to them and uh, and and they've been responding in their own ham-handed ways in their own kleptocratic ways of course handing like what 10 to, to something like 90 percent of the trillion of the multi-trillion dollar bail it really goes to corporations you know but you know it was as that still leaves a, quite a bit <laughs> that that went to you know our bank accounts and, and went to this unemployment uh, scheme that has really been you know keeping tens of millions of people alive and and now it's going to expire at the end of this month like uh, what in two days so who knows who knows what's next the the so, unemployment yeah 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 yeah, yeah. well I, I assume that what the, that the ruler class will do what they always do they'll give just enough to enough people to prevent a real kind of upswelling of the working class or 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 a revolution uh I think you could legitimately claim that the majority of people involved in the revolution are the people of no property, the people who have got to the point where they have nothing left to lose except potentially their liberty and their lives. And that's why a lot of governments would subsidize basic food staples like bread and milk and things. So as a parent, if you can feed your children and try and put a roof over their heads, then that's a, then, then that's a responsibility that, that, that you take on board. But... But what I'm really thinking about now is is how things go forward. I mean, the Black Lives Matter movement, I think they'll struggle to continue every night to come out and protest and protest and protest, especially as people are arrested and people start being fed through the judicial system and the prison system and perhaps huge fines. And I read today that some of the bail conditions around people who've been arrested is that they can no longer attend any yeah. uh, protests going forward and and then there's the the police military uh governmental presidential response so i mean are we witnessing the birth of a fascist state where they're sending the military onto the streets to kidnap people and put them in the more unmarked vehicles and take them to well i mean what are we we're going to start heading towards detention centers or concentration camps or if the jails begin to, to fill up I mean, where will it put the excess people? So can the Black Slave Movement continue in its present uh, state, which, which from someone outside is protest without uh, protest without result? It, it appears to be protest for the sake of protest because there no, is no tangible uh, result from the protest itself. And will the government, which has militarized the police over the last decade, just send in the cops, send in the military, and you've got like a low warfare, a low civil war between one aspect of the citizens and one aspect of the government. And that doesn't that doesn't sound good for the next 10 or 15 years going forward for people aged 15 to 30 to be arrested, given a custodial sentence or to have this uh have a criminal record on the verdict commas for for taking on the state it's where will it all go that's the sixty four thousand dollar right prison yeah it's really unknown at this point and it's of course you know you got this this movement is happening at the at a time when uh you know it's probably fair to say that a very large number a percentage of the people participating in are unemployed you know <laughs> because there's uh, suddenly we have 30 million newly unemployed people in this country you know and uh and then at the same time they're they've been stuck at home you know trying to be the, doing the lockdown pandemic thing and you know so there's all these other factors mm -hmm. going on if people and people don't know what the future holds they're, they're unemployed and they have time on their hands but the, and maybe even a little money but the money's about to run out you know it's and uh and they've been stuck in isolation and now they're getting um, a lot of uh, camaraderie at protests mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but in terms of the uh, in terms of any kind of things being won, it, it definitely what's going on at the municipal level all over the country, and, and to some extent at the state level, depending on the state, it, to varying degrees, is actual reforms uh, that are where 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 sometimes uh, police budgets are being reduced and and the money is being set, uh, put in 
to other uh, kinds of areas. So it's nothing uh, impressive. But I mean, it would be unfair to say that there's no results in terms of yeah. like there's definitely been a, a, the conversation has changed in a way that is really quite something to hear, at least in terms of when you listen to the you know, public or mainstream or corporate press, uh, they are talking about a lot of things in different ways. Um, you know, rather than saying things like uh, protesters allege that Christopher Columbus, uh, uh, you know, killed a lot of people and uh, held slaves, you know, the, it's talked about differently. Now on CNN, they'll say Christopher Columbus, who colonized uh, the, the country and, and killed a lot of people and and held slaves. You know, they just talk about it as a fact, you know, the, the, the racist history of this country, you know, they'll talk about that as a fact now, not like some people allege the country has a racist history, you know. So, I mean, it's, it seems kind of minor, uh, th these kinds of changes in a way, and, and maybe it is, but it's it, the, the conversation is being affected and so, to some extent laws are being affected, but it's too early to tell, you know, where this is going or, but, you know, one thing that's, there's, there's definitely prog progressive groups bl like black led progressive groups that are making a lot of demands of legislatures at various levels that are being listened to uh, much more than they would have been uh, a few months ago. But then at the same time, you, you know, we're in the midst of a pandemic that is affecting black and brown people like four to one or five to one compared to white people. So it's just astounding the, the, uh, the, what the, the compounded impacts of people being in work or working in essential so-called essential jobs and living in overcrowded conditions and having inadequate access to healthcare and all this, you know, all this stuff comes suddenly is so starkly compounded in the form of these statistics, five to one, four to one. It's just, mm -hmm. a, you know, really quite something that's, so that's, that's also my, yeah. i was just gonna say that's really my main concern is that a lot of reforms will be micromanaged so you'll get people paying lip service to the crimes of slavery in a, an american uh racist supremacist history you'll get you'll get the crumbs from the table for food banks and for outdoor relief or whatever is going to come out of this. So I think for me, both the state and the political establishment and the corporate elite will just say whatever needs to be said and do whatever needs to be done on a limited basis just to keep a cap on this. But if you're correct in 30 million people becoming unemployed in the next two that's already happened. We're there now. That's that's where we're at now. Thirty million. <laughs> yeah, okay. I mean, the, yeah. The, ultimately, so they'll have to do something, when, right? When those people have no money, and you've right. already five million people living on the streets, or probably six. Yeah, right. And yeah. Uh, there's there, there there's a powder keg there, just just waiting to explode. <laughs> if, this, if this was any other country in the world, the CIA and the Soros foundations and the NGOs would be in provoking. <laughs> A militarized reaction from the protesters. A few people would be shot on the back. The government would be blamed. The police would be blamed. Then you would have regime change. But obviously, this, 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 that's done by America, not. Well, done. that could. You never know. It's a new, new. I mean, we got. Yeah, I mean, but you got, you got them sending out uh, federal agents in the street to, you know, snatch people. So who, who knows? But it doesn't seem like Trump is such a lame fascist, though. He's such a. I mean, he's such an incompetent fascist, such a completely narcissistic. I mean, it doesn't. It seems like he's trying to play by the fascist playbook, but he's really not executing things all that effectively. I don't know. I think he's trying to be president rather than being president. If that makes any sense. And with the elections coming up in November, because he's a Republican, he's always going to push the law and order aspect of this. I mean, we hear fifty nights of rioting in Portland, but I've been watching it. It seems very choreographed to me almost like the rats that we had here. So people go down and protest. They make a lot of noise. They do a lot of shouting. The police response is clear the streets. This is illegal. And they're using is it either stun grenades or flash grenades and tear gas canisters. And then they appear to move forward and the protesters appear to move back. And it's like a choreographed dance forward and back, yep. and, forward and, back and then some people end up getting arrested. So, yeah. Uh, 
very familiar Belfast setting, kind of you know, and including the the boarded up buildings. And I mean, it's it's uh, yeah. The accents. What's that? Are, are yeah, the, the, the accents are different. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Are, are they actually deploying like uh, rubber bullets, button rounds? Seen oh yeah, some. yeah, and bean bean bags and uh, pepper bags and uh, yeah, 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 right. But there's something else called a pepper bag and, and incredible amounts of tear gas and yeah, flashbangs and uh, LRAD. These these sound weapons, uh, you know. Okay, uh, they're they're they've got uh, uh, something that looks like a green laser. I mean, I've seen pictures of it, I've but I don't that. know what it was like. <laughs> What is this? It's only the federal agents have that one. That the local cops don't have whatever that is, and of course they got their tasers. Yeah, well, lots of lots of uh, rubber bullets. You know, plastic rubber rubber coated uh, steel bullets. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know the baton rounds that they used to deploy here. They're I mean a good seventy mile an hour, something incredible. And right. They, they kill one in fifteen and they injure one in three. I think are right. Kind of Statistics when they hit the, the statistics, yeah, there was something in I don't know some publication recently about the the so-called less than lethal weaponry that they use in the, here, and I think the statistics was from U.S. police departments. I'm not sure, but it was like three yeah. percent fatal, fifteen percent total permanent injury. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's not that's scary. Like you that's know, that's scary. Yeah, for people who are unarmed and a peaceful and a peaceful protest, like it's uh, it's it's quite a quite a vicious response so nobody knows where this is going to go there's no political representation for black lives matter other than i don't know black representatives within the democratic well no black lives matter i mean there are there are it's an organization with a very eloquent uh spokespeople uh women uh and there's uh, you know so it's not but it's not uh it's they they've been been very uh other than what's that they're like lobbyists or a pressure group rather than being no no there i mean i think i think there's 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 so many different uh you know people who with different agendas that that are that would identify with the movement and i think there's some confusion and for me as well as whether it's a you know because it's partly an organization that was actually founded by specific people uh to <clears throat> but it was um but it's also become uh, just like an, an idea, much like, you know, industrial workers of the world or students for a democratic society or even the IRA. I mean, it, you know, I mean, so many different things. It's, it's a mindset. It's a sort of way that people identify politically more than an actual organization, even though it's also an actual organization. But I think they've been. Yeah. What's that? It's a philosophy. I would imagine. Yeah, and and they've and we, you know with, with, they can they have a lot of a lot of demands and a lot of uh, perspective around uh, history and and the, how society is about, about mass incarceration and institutional racism and all sorts of stuff, but without uh, you know necessarily being a political party in the sense of like uh, I mean I think there's a lot of cynicism in in that whole uh, crowd about the political process because as you say I mean Biden is uh, you know a joke and and he's he was behind the crime bill in 1996 or 94 and you know it's well known at this point uh, in among uh, many people particularly among you know, radicals and the uh, black radicals and white radicals and all sorts of people that this is they you know people like biden are just part of the whole mass incarceration and imperialism problem you know but and and when it comes to i mean in the congress i mean there it, this the system's rigged so if you're going to run for office i mean you know it's, there's basically no chance for victory unless you're running under one of the two parties but the right. most uh, you know there's definitely been an effort to to try to uh, take over the democratic party on the part of the you know, bernie sanders wing of the party which very much includes the uh you know many prominent uh, black and brown uh politicians like uh, you know alexandria ocasio cortez and and uh, the, you know the uh presley uh, uh, and ilhan omar you know there's some great uh, prog really good I say radicals in the Congress, but there's just a handful of them. Like in the last military budget, it was like 100 uh, out of the 435 representatives that voted voted against it. Mm. You know, so it had a super majority, a veto proof super majority of uh, you know, bipartisan. But still, it's 100 that voted against it. So I, I think you could roughly say, you know, the progressive the efforts to <clears throat> sort of uh, radicalize the Democratic Party have 
have de- definitely failed, but but there's more progressives than than there were maybe ten years ago. Well, yeah, maybe they're sowing the seed going forward. You know, and maybe maybe there'll be a new crop to grow out of that of of real radicals who want to change. But I, I believe people who join the system, you know, they claim they're going to reform it. Then they join it. Then they become part of it. Then they defend it. Is my personal kind of uh, experience. I think that tends to be how it goes, and there needs to be protest in the street in a big way. Uh, you know, you need to make it financial. You need to be able to shut cities down. And but yeah. if people are capable of that, of kind, of, you know, general strikes and that kind of thing, then anything is possible. You can make politicians do anything if you have yeah. that kind of power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, look, that's great. I just hope I hope something comes out of the the sacrifice of all the people, not just all the people who have been lynched by police brutality, but all those people who have protested, all the people who have been arrested, all the people who have They're been... suffering terrible trauma, as, uh-huh. as you know. I mean, and, and really medical, serious medical problems, because as you know, being from Belfast, tear gas is really bad for you. You know, and breathing tear gas on, uh, day after day is, is really bad for you. And I, you know, I've been intentionally avoiding uh, that myself, but I have been to a lot of protests in, in my life, including in ones that involved a lot of tear gas and never more than two or three days on end of, of having, a, you know, encountering a lot of tear gas. But I think even that, I mean, I, you know, even just from one serious day of tear gas at in Quebec City in 2000, I had a welt on my eye for six months after that. You know, I mean, this is, it's, they're not it's chemical weapons it's not fucking around and and in the chest i'm sure it leaves scar tissue yeah uh, if you're overexposed to it uh for any for any length of time okay well when you come on when we'll see you back and god knows when we'll see you back again. yeah god knows right you ask the virus you know I'd, i'll come as soon as as soon as uh it's safe you know uh, and then doing a tour is going to be another question because like uh, what happens with the, if the venues are only allowed to have 25% capacity or whatever, you know, that's not tenable for the venues or for the musicians. So who knows? I know. I know. It's a mysterious future. In, in no its... future in many, many, many respects. Well, it's a lovely chat. Yeah. With you. Really yeah, great chatting with you. So I'll, I'll uh, tune in one of these evenings when you're doing your Monday night lockdown specials. It's just See, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm not doing the open mics anymore on Mondays, but I'm still doing random uh, interviews on other days, and and I'll, yeah, I'll be doing other broadcasting though. Anyway. I saw a cup. I saw a band that are doing. Uh, what is it? The Black Something Rising. Oh uh, yeah, this Greek band. Uh, what is a ba- Bard Noir uh, doing a Black Flag Flying? Wonderful rendition. Yeah, fantastic one. All right. <laughs> really. Great. Proper rock and roll. <laughs> yeah, but how are things in Belfast? What's the what's the situ- what's the scene like with lockdown, with uh, unemployment? Or you're, you're in, are you in Belfast? Is, yeah, yeah, now? yeah, or down North Belfast. Yeah, yeah. We've had the uh, the people reacted quicker than the government when it came to like self isolation. People started to prevent their kids from going to school because we could all. I mean, anyone who's all got the internet can read. What was happening in China? What was happening in Spain? What was happening in Italy? And we were all frightened because we could just see this domino effect that it was coming our way. Uh, yeah. Then we had people from Ireland on holiday in Italy skiing. And Italy yeah. became one of the epicenters uh, in Europe initially of uh, the COVID nineteen virus. Uh, so those people brought it back here. So the, the government, the British government. Boris Johnson and the, and the British Parliament at Westminster, we, we have devolved regional parliaments. So we have like Stormont in the north, then there's a regional parliament in Scotland and one in Wales. But what happened was they wanted a national response. So our politicians got to get out of jail card because they just waited to be told from Boris Johnson and the British Parliament uh, what steps they were going to uh, instigate and, and the timeline involvement. And I, I just, I thought it was a disgrace that, that that was political cowardice. I felt that we were all screaming, fuck sick, lock the place down. How many people you want to die? I mean, we've had, we, we have a population of around 2 million and we've had something like 550 deaths, COVID-19, which kind of sounds okay because we were talking about like, 12, 14, 16,000 people thought it was like a plague. You were going to have people dying in the streets. But in reality, only 5% of the population here, 5% have been exposed. 
Right. So we had 600 deaths from 5%. When you multiply yeah. that by 20, all of a sudden you're hitting 12 or 13 or 14,000 people. Uh, but so nursing homes, because of the age profile and, uh, and the health, I think 40% of all our COVID-19 deaths have been in uh, nursing homes of people over 65, really. Uh, so we went into lockdown and people were put on furlough, which is the same scheme that you might have alluded to earlier, where people are paid kind of mm -hmm. to stay at home. Uh, then the government's concerned about the economy, but that's only because the corporations and the capitalists will be saying to them, you know, here, we can't have this, we're not making money. Uh, and mm -hmm. you potentially get a mass unemployment. In, in sectors like hospitality, I mean, Ireland's done very well the last decade, <clears throat> 20 years, excuse me, in tourism. And I suppose you have that economic cycle, the boom bust. Mm -hmm. So whenever the world is on a credit boom, people go on holiday, put it on their card, everything's roses in the garden. So it's it's devastated kind of the bar trade, the restaurants, the hotels, the theatres, the nightclubs, uh, the cruise ships, everything that's associated. And then that has a spillover for taxi drivers and maybe private bus transport and a few other things. So we're slowly coming out of the lockdown and that they're trying to get the kids back to school in September, but they're only going to go for two days. So mm. like half school on Monday and Tuesday, and then the school gets the food clean on the Wednesday, then Thursday, Friday, the other half of the school comes in. So, so for us, the older generation are worried about their personal health and safety. Mm. And for parents, they're concerned about the younger children who are maybe beginning to miss out on that social aspect, the discipline yeah. of education, that social aspect of kids playing with other kids. But yeah. about about six weeks ago, you could drive down the road when it was against, you know, uh, COVID regulations to be doing that and see no cars on the road. Mm -hmm. And then three weeks ago, it's just like everything's back to normal. Mm -hmm. The shops are busy. They've reopened the bars. I was in the bar on Monday night watching the football match. First time I've been in a bar in months. Mm -hmm. so, lots of people in there drinking, just not really, not really caring. And some of the city centre bars that have reopened, it seems to be the young people who are not overly reacting, but they're responding to having been locked down and locked in, and and they're all out kind of partying. And but we're getting these wee spikes at different places. Mm -hmm. so if one person gets it and then there's a family you know people have a karaoke night or there's a family celebration around a birthday or something one person has it gives it to 10 others they take it home so what they're yeah. trying to do is the the r rate if it stays below one then they're going to allow people to continue as normal and if it right. goes one like 1.3 1.4 in different areas they're going to have local regionalized uh lockdowns and yeah we're going to do until they get uh, either a vaccine or uh, I don't know they get their herd immunity, which I think part of this is about lockdown, ease the lockdown, more people get infected, lockdown, ease the lockdown, more people get infected. Eventually, you'll end up with <coughs> herd immunity around seventy percent, but we right. only have five percent of people actually exposed. That's quite that's quite worrying. Yeah, that's very interesting situation, huh? <laughs> same there then is it very similar yeah except that i think most people haven't even heard of the the reproductive reproduction rate of one you know i mean if they've listened to bbc in the middle of the night or something maybe they've heard about it because of angela merkel talking about it or something but you know they uh it's it's just a disaster here i think people don't most people just feel really confused and uninformed and don't Misin know they're misinformed rather than uninformed yeah, they're mis I mean, they're being they're getting lots of different information from different places and there's no systematic national plan. And that's a disaster because it's a Nash, it's an it's a nation and, and there are no borders and that, you know, people can go wherever they want. And it's spreading along the highway corridors. You know, you can see it, it like where it's spreading. There's a highway that goes from Florida to Maine and it's, you know, spreading along the highway. Yeah. <laughs> it's your main arterial route. That's where people travel. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Diners, the, the rest stops for the truck drivers and yeah the yeah well let's hope we're all here next year yeah and yeah, most of us will be anyway yeah 
but <laughs> I'll go here. It's nearly eleven o'clock, so yeah, you you get some sleep, and I'll send you the MP4. <laughs> Thank you very Take much. Take care for a great talking to you. All right. All right. Bye bye.